when you talk about you know the physical supply dwindling and the premiums for physical metal and you compare that versus the you know this futures price that you see on Bloomberg and CNBC I mean clearly there's a dichotomy and you just wonder how much longer it will persist Hi, I'm Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Special of the Week for October 11th through October 18th, 2022. Kilo Silver Bars from JBR Recovery. These three nines fine bars are cast with an individual serial number and are LBMA Good Delivery accredited. They also have the unique distinction of being refined to a high purity from recycled sources. Best of all, they're available at only $3.50 over spot while supplies last. Our number for all orders is 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Craig Hemke from TF Metals Report. Craig, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Elijah. It's always good to see you, my old friend. I hope you're well. Well, doing very well, quite busy uh, lately. It seems like the phones have been ringing off the hook. We've seen such demand for precious metals. Um, and I know we were recently talking with Andy Sheckman, the CEO of Miles Franklin, and he was saying how you know one of the largest wholesalers right now is almost completely wiped out of product. Um, and when it comes to kind of what he's been seeing right now. He hasn't seen uh, supply as dire, the supply situation for silver as dire as it is right now, except for in 2008 when there was no supply for about three months. But um, your perspective on what we're seeing right now in the physical market, it seems like uh, people across the industry, uh, dealers are just being wiped out. Yeah, there certainly seems to be a shortage of supply. You can see that in all the, the premiums that you get from dealer to dealer to dealer. Um, the U.S. Mint stopped making coins, I don't even how long ago, I mean, months ago, right? Because um, they can't get them. I, you know, it, it it's just presents, again, this kind of dichotomy in how silver and gold and just about every other commodity is priced. You know, you, you trade these futures contracts, which were originally designed as a way for producers you know, to manage their risk and forward sell, and then taking the other side of that would be, you know, speculators. And instead, I mean, it's everything so financialized these days that the price gets set by these futures contracts when really the, that price is determined by the supply and the demand of said contracts. Uh, you know, if, if hedge funds and the like are willing to get in there and be long or in this case, be short. And so you've got this, this weird little dichotomy going on in silver that hasn't often happened in the past. You've got really short physical supply, drainage of physical supply. Uh, what The LBMA just lost 5% of their vaulted silver in a month. They're down to maybe, mm, uh, what, what was it, total 320 million ounces or so in their total LBMA vaults. Um, so you've got this clear shortage of supply, not only in silver, but there's runs in other LME metals like copper and problems with aluminum. You remember what happened with nickel earlier this year and things like that. But yet you've got hedge funds, which are trading the COMEX futures and pounding it lower and lower based off of what they anticipate is a soaring dollar. And, you know, they expect that to be a profitable trade. These hedge funds don't have, they don't have any silver to deliver. I mean, it's not like, you know, whatever hedge funds that show up on the commitment of traders report are actually suppliers of silver or sitting on stockpiles of silver. No, they're just, they're just going short, thinking that they can buy that short back at a lower price at a later date. They've been squeezed now several times in a row because, I mean, the market just isn't having it. But it really, when you talk about you know, the physical supply dwindling and the premiums for physical metal, and you compare that versus the, you know, this futures price that you see on Bloomberg and CNBC, I mean, clearly there's a dichotomy and you just wonder how much longer it will persist. 
I mean, we're seeing because of increased demand, an elevation of premiums across the board. But what will be the breaking point in your perspective? Well, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, people realize, well, what is the price? You know, if I can't buy it for less than, you know, whatever, $26, you know, maybe that's about the best deal anybody can find anywhere. But yet they tell me on CNBC it's 19. Well, you know, at some point, and we've had this happen in the past, it, it, the, it, the gap grows so wide that it calls into question. It's actual, you know, reporters and media thinking, well, what's going on here? And then eventually the gap narrows. Most recent time this happened was in March of 2020, when in kind of a general market liquidation event and everything was just, you know, if it had a bid, it was getting sold. Comex silver futures went all the way to about 12. But you couldn't buy silver for less than about 24. And so you had this this huge disparity, and eventually they kind of met in the middle. Uh, premiums came down, and the price came back up, and it's something like that will probably happen again. I what I think is most curious at this point is the actual price of the COMEX silver. These hedge funds I talk about rarely get as heavily short as they have been on multiple occasions over the last ninety days, and three times they've just had their faces ripped off in a short squeeze. This most recent one, two weeks ago, silver went from 1750 to a, what, a 21 in not even 10 days. Um, and they've now fallen for that three times. And now here, you know, it seems like they're getting short again. Um, at some point, you kind of run out of sellers and shorters of the, of the COMEX futures contract. And when, you know, it's just like at a market top, you run out of buyers and people want to get long. And so we're probably much, 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 very, uh, really, really close to the lows. I don't think we're going to see new lows uh, in the COMEX price uh, this year. I think we've seen that now and the chart is starting to bear that out as, out as well. But it definitely all put all that put together, you know, that this spot price is driven by the futures price. And it really should be the other way around. But boy, you get these periods like this where it really makes it mind boggling. And on a technical level, I mean, it does seem like silver broke through that level of support a few months back around that $21 level and gold broke through um, the mid 1600s a couple weeks ago. So I am hearing some analysts saying that prices could fall lower, especially with gold um, to possibly even like the 1300s. Why do you think the lows are already in? Well, in let's separate the two, gold versus silver. In gold, I you know, again, I don't know about 1300. I you'd have to have some real total wipeout risk off event, you know, where a bond market calamity in the US where rates spike to 5% or something and the stock market falls to 2500 on the S&P and everybody just dumping everything again like they did in March of 2020. Um, but I, you're right to reference a chart cuz silver held $22 about a year and a half. And when it broke through there in May, it spent six weeks trying to get back above. And then when it failed, it went to 18, actually 17 and a half. Um, gold held 1680 to 1700 for about two years. And it recently broke that and fell to 1625. And now it's trying to get back above 1700. Like I said, silver couldn't do it over a period of five or six weeks. If gold fails to do it, yeah, there's probably would signal more downside in gold too. So you're going to have to watch that really closely, especially on a weekly closing basis over the next month, I guess, in gold. Silver though, the chart looks like it wants to have turned. I mean, it, you can see all kinds of, you know, reverse head and shoulder bottoms, you know, it's been filling around, getting back above its 50 day. It looks in completely different from gold. And actually, go back to April, silver let everything down. Silver broke down well before gold. Like I just said, it broke its support in May, where gold held out until, what, to September. So silver looks like it's trying to get its act together, trying to at least stabilize. Um, on the daily chart of gold, it just keeps making lower lows and lower highs. But silver actually made a series, you know, a higher low and a higher high recently. So silver's got, I think, that's why I can say I think silver's probably seen the worst of it. Unless, again, you just get this total wipeout liquidation event, you know, like we had in early March of 2020. But I think silver's probably seen the worst of it. Again, that commitment of trader structure, if, if you know, if many of us recognize the way these, you know, markets are priced that, 
the banks as the suppliers of those contracts most of the time, the bullion banks, when they get heavily short and the speculators get heavily long on the commitment of traders report, we all sit back and go, well, it's just a matter of time till this gets rolled over. And, and that's usually how it works. Well, it's just the opposite now. The hedge funds, the speculators have gotten heavily short and the banks have gotten heavily long. So why would we expect the banks now to start a losing streak, you know, where the specs win by driving it even lower? So there's a number of things that I think you can put together to think that silver and then, you know, you combine it, it has seen a low in, even in the COMEX price. You combine that with that physical situation like you're talking about and demand for silver, you know, all of the, uh, you know, the green movement, the solar panels, the batteries, everything else uh, makes, again, makes you feel like, uh, your risk reward ratio in silver is heavily skewed toward reward at this point. And when it comes to what is happening in the economy, we are seeing uh, a hotter than expected inflation rate again uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And obviously, a lot of people think that this is under reporting the inflation rate, but it's again above 8%. Your take on the release of that number and how it has impacted markets recently? That's just the same old Fed standard operating procedure. The time to have been tightening was a year ago or more when they were telling us, you know, that it was transitory. That was the time to start tightening. So now they're going full bore tightening when inflation is due to start cooling off. I don't know, next month, maybe early, maybe by January or whatever. And they're going to be tightening into this crashing stagflationary recession. And so they're just making things worse, the Fed. Um, they make it worse every single time because they're always uh, backward looking rather than forward looking. They're always reactionary and rather than being proactive. And so we're going to end up with a sharply contracting economy. I mean, geez, look at mortgage rates and all of the debt that has to be restructured and, and repaid now at higher interest rates. I mean, it's, it's a disa economic disaster that's building all, it, you know, and blame it all on the Fed too loose and now too tight. And so, what will happen, though, I mean, there's this notion that they're going to draw the balance sheet back down and let rates normalize at some level. Um, what will happen is they will eventually pivot, try to then again go too tight and try to or too loose to try to get things going again. Um, and, the, you know, the renewed QE and lower interest rates and all that stuff is what's coming in 2023. I thought it would come. You know, I wrote about this in January. I thought a 20% stock market drop, like in the fourth quarter of 18, would be enough to force a pivot. And I thought that would happen by summertime this year. I thought it would happen pretty fast. And, that's, and I thought, gee, by the second half of this year, we should be you know, soaring right back in the precious metals. Instead, it's been more drawn out process. You know, and obviously, the metals have gone lower than I thought they'd go by 10% you know, or so. But the process is still the same. I mean, the Fed is just so far behind the curve that they're dragging this out. Um, and so once they start uh, changing policy and cutting rates and renewing QE because somebody's got to buy the debt, that's when the precious metals will soar again. You get a little sniff of that from time to time, like these short squeezes or the reversals that we've seen today uh, here on the 13th after the CPI. But we're not there yet. Um, the Fed has bound and determined just to kill everything, You know, just keep hiking until the, everything starts to break. And we they haven't broken everything yet. So we're probably more frustration and, and short term pain to come before we get there. But man, I just I'm pretty excited about where everything's going to be by 23 and into 24, just because more and more people are realizing, that, especially with this next pivot, there ain't no turning back. There's no going back. I mean, this is MMT and QE plus QE on steroids. Um, every single time they turn policy, it, it's it's more and more cash. The printers go even faster and the metals will soar even faster next time than they did this last time. And how then do you think the Fed will justify that? Because if we're seeing inflation higher than normal uh, or higher than expected, I should say, then how are they going to justify any, any sort of pivot? It seems like the only logical thing to do is to continue to rate, raise rates. What, what choice will they have, Elijah? You know, it's like they're trying to say now, well, we don't have any choice to keep hiking. Oh, we know we're going to put you know, millions of people out of work. Again, not at the Fed. You know, they all keep making their six-figure salaries, but the lower and middle income people that are working two and three jobs and desperately trying to keep things together in the face of this economic calamity, oh, they'll go ahead and put them out of work. Sure, no problem. 
Well, the same thing. They'll use the same logic to have to start cutting and 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 turning the QE machine on again because who's going to buy the debt? And we're still running trillion dollar deficits. We're up to 31 trillion in total debt that has to get uh, refunded and rolled over. Well, who's going to buy it? It's not the Bank of Japan, not the ECB, not the People's Bank of China, certainly not the Russians. You can go around the planet. Who's going to buy it? I mean, the, the Fed has to be the buyer of last resort. And they'll justify it by saying, well, if we don't, the economic calamity and all that kind of stuff, and how are we going to afford the transfer payments? You see the cost of living adjustment on Social Security is going up 8% next year? <laughs> Where's that going to come from, right? Especially as tax receipts fall in this slowing economy. So they'll do it. I mean, they can talk a good game. That's what they do. That's one of their only options is to jawbone. But Put between a rock and a hard place, they're not just going to let everything crash r- around them. They'll try to keep the plate spinning. I mean, that's, I don't see how that's even uh, up for discussion. It does seem like we're seeing a, quite a bit of a pullback recently in the stock market. And as you mentioned, it seems like the economy is under a uh, huge amount of stress. So it, I guess that would be maybe the justification for why the Fed has to pivot. But um, do you think a f- Fed pivot will actually? help anything, help the economy, help the stock market uh, reflate your perspective on that? Sure. Yeah, it'll help the stock market go back up. I mean, the best performing stock markets are as those with inflation, uh, mega inflation, hyperinflation, whatever. Um, and that's what we'll get. They won't ever drown out inflation. Inflation will remain, even on the CPI level, 4% plus, maybe worse. Inflation expectations will finally get sticky and start to rise. Everybody get used to four and five and 6% inflation. But the Fed will have to drive interest rates back down to try to get the economy going again, to try to have a benchmark that they can refund all this treasury debt, you know, and and uh, and keep uh, that Ponzi scheme going. Then all of a sudden, you know, people will recognize this is entrenched negative real interest rates, you know, even off inflation expectations, two and 3% negative. And then that's that's when the wheels just come off and gold and silver soar. All other risk assets, the stock market, commodities, everything soars. But they won't have any choice. I mean, they won't. They, they cannot. This notion that Powell is Volcker reincarnated is just folly. I mean, it's just totally you can't compare now to 1980 when there was a tri- not even a trillion dollars in total debt and debt to GDP was 30 percent, not 130 percent. So the new economy going forward is going to be trying to keep inflation in line by trying to manage demand. But the supply of dollars is just going to have to keep growing and growing and growing. And the Fed will make it happen because, again, it's the least worst option, just like they're claiming now with forcing people out of work. It does seem like the least worst option there. But I mean, I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of people um, struggling, especially with inflation. And I think it's just going to get worse if what you're saying is true, that the Fed is going to pivot. Um, so what is your perspective on just the average person out there who might be watching is, ver- is suffering from inflation? What do they do? They've got to somehow get out of their own dollars, right? I mean, if you're sitting in... I mean, if you're saving in dollars, you know, that's what your savings account is, and you're just holding dollars, they're just going to get eaten away. It's the most insidious tax ever invented. You know, that you might have $1,000 in savings, it buys you $1,000 of goods today, but it buys you $900 worth of goods a year from now. I mean, they're just stealing from you. That's inflation steals from you. And so you've got to find at least, even if you've only had $1,000 or $5,000 of savings, you've got to find investments that will outpace the rate of inflation so that your savings rate grows faster than the rate of inflation. That's at least what some of these risk assets will do once, you know, the Fed has peddled the metal again. The problem is the people with investable assets, I mean, that's 10% of the population. Yeah, what you're referencing is the 90% that don't have any stocks at all or only have a limited amount of equities or any other investments, or the 65% of people that don't even have $500 in their savings account. You know, if they get a, their car breaks down, they don't have money, uh, you know, to be able to pay the bill. They just go deeper in debt. That, in the end, and, I, and I, again, I don't think we're at this end yet. In the end, this is a a terrible, um, I guess, recipe for societal discord. 
and societal unrest and a turn to, well, I mean, I, again, I, you might think I sound crazy, but it look, go back. Everybody should be, I got the book right here on my desk. Everybody should read, be reading their history of Weimar Germany and the hyperinflation that eventually led to dictatorship and fascism because people were willing to vote for it. Hey, look, if you can somehow get things under control, crime, uh, prices, all this stuff, I'll vote for you. I don't care how you're going to do it. And that's how, that's how you got into the 30s in Germany was you came out of Weimar, uh, you know, the, all of that problem of the 20s. And that's probably eventually where this all heads because eventually, again, like any other time in the past, this is a recipe for massive societal unrest and pain. But to be, before we can get there, yeah, the Fed's going to pivot. They're going to print because that money's got to come from somewhere. The world is desperately short of dollars. and It's got to come from somewhere. It'll come from the Fed. And obviously we can't give personalized financial advice, but what you say, you know, a good principle, I think, is to, you know, look at, you know, the dollar holdings that you have and realize in inflation that devalues and it's important to hold a real assets. And if people are interested in con continuing to track this with you, they can go to tfmetalsreport.com. Can you share with us about that and any last thoughts you had? It's all part of what we talk about. You know, it's been such a brutal six months that, I mean, I simply, you know, when the metals are going up, it's fun, right? And we can talk about prices and charts and all that stuff. But when the metals don't go up, we got to, you know, you try to look at the big picture. And so that's really what my site has morphed into. It's, it's an online community. I mean, it's global in its reach of people that, yeah, I mean, we just recognize we're all in the same boat and we help each other out by sharing information and links and watching the news flow every day and, you know, everything else that goes with it. It's not always about just simply got to buy some silver, got to buy some gold. It's, it's about understanding the macroeconomics, the macro picture, the history uh, as to why you want to own that kind of stuff and in preparation for all this stuff that you and I've been talking about, Elijah. So I encourage everybody, if if you're kind of waking up to how, where the world is and where it's going, I think TF Metals Report can be kind of a harbor in the storm. So please check us out, just tfmetalsreport.com. All right, Craig, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Always fun, my friend. Good to see you. Take care. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.